This is Arts 107, Impressionism to Contemporary Art History, asynchronous online class in spring 2023 at Bethany Lutheran College. You're listening to adjunct professor Karis Carmichael Braun as she reads, expostulates, and adds interesting little nuggets that may be part of and have been extensively researched outside of the seventh edition of History of Modern Art by H. H. Arneson and Elizabeth C. Mansfield. Chapter three. We're still in chapter three, and there are a few more artists that we're going to tackle here. Namely, Medardo Rosso, Expansions in Sculpture. The Italian artist Medardo Rosso, born 1858 and died in 1928, was instrumental in expanding the definition of sculpture for the modern era. Medardo Rosso was born in Turin, Italy, and worked as a painter until 1880. After being expelled from the Accademia di Brera, Milan, in 1883 for leading petitions, complaining about the school hours and the lack of live models. He lived in Paris for two years, worked in Aimé Jules Dalou's atelier, and met Degas at the Salon des Independents. Emile Zola even bought a bronze by Rosso, bestowing on him a considerable amount of celebrity. And before we move on, um, here is a question, and it doesn't have an answer, and I just want to kind of let you sit and marinate in this for a little bit. Just think about, as we're going through the textbook, we hear about a lot of very particular artists, but not their teachers, who actually may have been more contemporaneously influential than their students, yet their students make it into the art history books. And I kind of want to ask yourself, why? Why does this happen? Is it because maybe the teachers weren't important, God forbid? Or maybe it's because the teachers stayed within their time's expectations and their faculty assignments? Or maybe it's because there's a different book that talks about them. So here's kind of the existential question. What do we learn about the people that we learn about? And what are the people that are not included? I mentioned before in a few lectures past that this survey course is basically a kind of Lutheran buffet where there's tater tots and there's coleslaw and there's stuff in a crock pot that's just giving you a taste. Again, I want to reiterate, this is just a sampling of the enormous world that has been shaped and given form by art history, a very particular type of history, which you guys signed up for, and I'm really happy you did. So I think about this, and I, I have to be a little bit honest here, I think about this because the school that I went to after Bethany, I have classmates who are now in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection. Their work has been shown at one of the most prestigious universities in the world, not uh, museums in the world. And my question is, what makes them the candidate that got to be written up about? And what makes others not a candidate? And again, this question doesn't really have an answer. But I want you to sit here and maybe chew on it a little bit. And as we go further into the semester, realize that the people that you read about in the history books are not just the most important people. They are people that contributed to and have a marked point of information that contributed toward the history, but that doesn't mean that they're alone. They had teachers, they had family, they had friends, and they had people who surrounded them who may have been just as influential to history. Anyway, back to the lecture. Around the time that Rosso was studying at the academia, he encountered a text that would galvanize his career. French poet and art critic Charles Baudelaire, and we've heard about him before, skewered sculpture as a 
humble associate of painting in his 1846 essay, Why Sculpture is Boring. The sculptures found in city squares, museum galleries, cathedral niches, and public exhibitions, Baudelaire wrote, were dry, cold, and academic, and lacked the imagination and sophistication of pictures. Rosso sought to disprove Baudelaire. Art, he stated, must be nothing else than the expression of some sudden sensation given to us by light. There are no such things as painting or sculpture. There exists only but life. In his decades-long attempt to convey this credo, Rosso created around 50 distinct sculptural objects in bronze, plaster, and wax that em emphasize the vagaries of visual perception. Rosso extended the formal experiments of Rodin, deliberately devolving, dissolving sculptural forms until only an impression remained. His favorite medium, wax, allowed the most imperceptible transition so that it became difficult to tell exactly at what point a face or figure emerges from an amorphous shape and many textured surface. With their rough forms, broken surfaces, and seemingly spontaneous compositions, these works prompted many writers to pronounce Rosso as an impressionist sculptor aligned with the painters Claude Monet and Camille Pizarro. And just a second, um, if you're listening, you might want to move your eyes toward the screen because uh, here's a little bit of a marshmallow, um, something sweet and fluffy. Um, if you can identify that painting that you see next to Rosso, five points um, to Gryffindor, Slytherin, Hufflepuff, or Ravenclaw, um, whoever you identify with. But anyway, um, send that to me in Moodle. Back to the lecture. Not only did Rosso focus on everyday contemporary subjects, but he also experimented with light in order to render sculpture ephemeral and seemingly um, un insubstantial. His heads and figures frequently portray portrayed as tired, meditative, laughing, or melancholy appear to be caught in fugitive visual, physical, or emotional states. As fleeting impressions of modern life, they stand in marked contrast to the monumental, idealized depictions typical of traditional sculpture before and during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Medardo Rosso rarely produced a single sculpture of a unique subject, but instead worked serially treating each cast individually and experimenting with different materials, patinas, and finishes. With fewer than 50 sculptural subjects developed over the course of his career, Rosso frequently revisited them, often after many years and with different surface treatments to manipulate light and shadow. And this is for some of you sculpture and um, art material nerds. After Rosso modeled the work in clay, the clay was cast in plaster. Next, this plaster version was cast in wax with plaster applied below the wax to provide structural support. This unconventional use of wax led Rosso's contemporaries to label him a revolutionary. At the time, artists, Rosso included, often used wax as an intermediate material in their production of bronze sculpture. In lost wax casting, for instance, molten wax is replaced by bronze and so lost during one of the final stages of the prolonged casting process. But for most artists, wax was a substance to be used in studios and foundries, not shown in galleries or museums. Nothing is material in space, Rosso said. The primacy he gave to the play of light and shadow is evident in the soft sfumato that envelops the portrait of an elderly caretaker of his apartment building in Milan, a work once owned by Emile Zola. Rosso regarded Woman with a Veil as one of his most accomplished. I have attempted to reproduce a boulevard impression, Rosso explained, a feminine 
physiognomy seen in the fugitive space of a fraction of a second, but caught just as I saw it. That is my conception of art. As in the concierge, Rosso used wax to convey the appearance of skin, hair, and fabric. Yet his treatment of the figure is more abstract, with blurred contours and grooved facets that seem to suggest not an acquaintance carefully studied, but a passerby quickly glimpsed. In his freshness of vision and his ability to catch and record the significant moment, Rosso added a new dimension to sculpture in works that are invariably intimate, small scale, and anti-heroic. And he anticipated the search for immediacy that characterizes so much of the sculpture to follow. For over a century, Rosso's career and works have remained obscure in the histories of art. And this is why many people are still unfamiliar with his work. Yet his contributions to modern sculpture will, were seen as fundamental by later sculptors such as, and we'll get to these guys, Umberto Baccioni, Henri Moore, Constantine Brincusi, and Alberto Giacometti. After 1899, Rosso spent most of his career in Paris. And this was associated more with French sculpture than with Italian. He'd gotten to know fellow sculptor Rodin, with whom he exchanged sculptures. But their friendship fell apart because Rosso felt Rodin didn't credit the former's influence on the latter. The changes in Rodin's sculpture after the exchange of work undoubtedly were influenced by Rosso's ideas, and thus the claims that Balzac, which we've seen before, heralded a new era, caused Rosso and his defenders to affirm that he, and not Rodin, was the true revolutionary. Supporters of Rosso insisted that his artistic innovations exceeded and preceded Rodin's, with one Rosso enthusiast asserting that the point of arrival for Rodin was merely the point of departure for Medardo Rosso. <laughs> 